Good morning, everybody. Um, this is a 10 o'clock meeting, a little bit late, of the Parking Committee. Um, I'm just calling this meeting to order. And Heather, do we have any public comments? No, sir. All right, with that being said, we've got three new members, which I don't see all of them, but I will let the one that I do see introduce herself <laughs> and uh, welcome. We appreciate you uh, volunteering to serve on this. So you want to introduce yourself and give us a little information? Sure. My name is Rick Parfus. This is broadcasting. Um, I live on Tarpon Drive. Um, my background is I've spent a bunch of years working for the Navy doing submarine acoustics. I've also spent several years working for the city of Wilmington doing water and sewer work. And my last job was working with the Army Corps, working in operations, which are the guys that come out and dredge our inlets and stuff. So that's uh, kind of it in a nutshell. Has anyone got any questions? I'm good. Uh, from me. Well, welcome. <coughs> Thanks. I'm looking forward to your help there. Uh, next is approval of the minutes. I guess, is everybody in agreement that we're good for the minutes of the last meeting? I'll make a motion to we approve the minutes from the last meeting, Brian. Second. All right. All in favor? All right. Aye. Um, number five, <clears throat> discussion of possible action on draft request for proposal for parking management services. So what we have in front of us is a pretty much a draft from Curie Beach. Um, we, we're kind of using it as a we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're using it as a guideline only. Um, of course, we have to make it our own. And um, that would be, I guess, staff's responsibility. I mean, if you want to comment on that, David, because... Yeah. Um, this is fairly detailed, and, and for everybody, I probably spoke a bit too quick when I said it would be readily adapted. Well, there's some decisions that should go in before in, into the solicitation of uh, like in in theirs they identify types of parking and they make some assumptions on which to uh, uh, for firms to to base their submittals in uh, on uh, a couple of things that came up in my mind and I've heard this bandied about and no definitive uh, uh, nothing definitive as far as I could change this. Um, but I had two, two questions and would like to offer that up for discussion. Is one, um, there's been talk about um, residents and property owners having some type of consideration or break on price or whether or not they pay for you know, to give rental properties a couple of free passes, that kind of thing. So um, I believe that those are critical considerations uh, and would be fundamental to whatever gets put out there. Uh, I know that we can get pretty close with the identifying the areas that exist today for parking, uh, but the the proof being put on how are you going to, you know, put an operation into into play with the uh, with those are the two questions I think um, are important. I just offer those up to, you know, to so we have something put out so we get something back that's because um, that'll go into that price structure and it'll also be part of a, I guess a demand model for them. Do we have the parking areas that the contractor consider should look at defined? I'm thinking they need to know there's 100, 200, 600, 1,000 spaces available. Uh, and this ties into, you know, the folks in my neighborhood are like, well, we don't want folks parking all up and down the street and stuff. And I don't, uh, we may be required to have X number of public parking spaces for federal funding um, by
Bob Kiesler from the Corps identified that when the Corps does their engineered beach, uh, they may have certain parking requirements. He did allude to the fact that he drove up and down the beach and says, oh, you got plenty of parking. Um, I know the residents are like, yeah, I don't want it my, on my street. So have we figured out how much we got to have, and are we able to tell the contractor, here's kind of the number? Because I think that all go into, well, this is what my staff has to be, this is what my software has to be. Um, and I would think we'd also want them to tell us, yeah, here's the, the range of income the town might have from this. What we have is we have existing ordinances that say where parking is allowed and where parking is not allowed. That, that's what we have. So okay. As part, you know, that would be available to them to look at and figure out you know, where it would be allowed and what that Because there may be parking not allowed by ordinance and there's pushback from the community on parking actually being there. Right, okay. or vice so, versa. And, and, and it's not realistic to expect a, a, a contractor to engage in that type of dialogue when sure. there's an ordinance in place that demarks exactly where the parking can be. Should we that's, attach that to the solicitation? Well, I mean, that that's not in here, but I would assume that's something that would need to be in there. Um, okay. But, um, you know, there's a culling process in part of this uh, solicitation that, um, you know, if somebody is really interested in doing it, I don't want to spoon feed them. You know, we can tell them where that information is and then they can go and look at it on their own and, and, and detail it out for us. That would be my approach to it. Um, now, on the other hand, town-owned properties that um, that exist, that's also a right. So, um, you know, without getting the maps and stuff like that, um, we, can, we can provide that. And I don't know how much of that information is available um, in the parking committee study previously, Tim, can you help out that? Uh, what well, that is the question? How many parking places have we got? We've got permanent parking places, depending on who's counting, staff counted between 192 and 196. The committees came up with some number up to about 226 uh, for permanent parking. Available parking is in the hundreds. It's above four or five hundred. And that would be basically the all street parking. parking is all that all street parking, which is a reason for the definitions of permanent and available. Permanent means that they're there, they're established, they can be used. Available means that if someone decides they want to widen their driveway, it's liable to become a non issue under the windows. So uh, that, that's what we have. So, so there's a other, there's areas of AEC, areas of environmental concern. Mm -hmm. that are in some of those right of ways where you can't park, some of them are obvious. Uh, you, know, you won't be able to do it in those areas. Um, but we, we counted, I think every area and right of way was, was counted. Um, and then some areas of right of way were excluded. We didn't count anything along Ocean Boulevard West, and we didn't count anything along Brother Gap. Um, but in the other areas we did, we, we, mainly because uh, we just didn't count on the gap. Uh, Ocean Boulevard, we have enough parking along both sides there in Oregon, so it wasn't counted. Is that study available? I mean, I've got to apologize. I know the town has the study, everything available the online. Actual, I haven't availed was, myself of it. There two separate committees that were done. <clears throat> those committees made recommendations. Those recommendations then carried to the board, and those recommendations were, were fulfilled, those portions that the board wanted to. So there may be reports somewhere, but there would have been no need to keep, you know, I mean, outside the minutes, uh, anything that was developed um, from one to the other. I mean, there would have been, we wouldn't have kept, uh, we all went out and, you know, they were hand counted. Okay. Um, 
There was never, I don't remember if we ever, did we ever draw a designated map? We didn't need one for the right way. We don't need one for the right way areas for the available parking because it's a map. It's a town map. Um, uh, the other ones, we identified each and every parking lot and the numbers of parking places in them. And we do have those. They've been distributed here before. Was that the... Hold on a minute. Okay, hold on a minute. Before we go down to Squirrel Hall here, my first two questions were, are residents and property owners going to have a different rate structure than the general public? That was my, that was my question. And, and you countered with what how many parking spaces we got. I'd like some general discussion on... From the staff's standpoint, I don't think that's a good idea. To start off with, I don't think you're solving your parking problem by having paid parking. And I think that if you do have a parking problem, right now residents believe that their parking is, is pretty much required at their structures and they're required to have so many for each bedroom. When you start opening up the parking to them at either a reduced rate or a free rate, they now will get the impression that not only can I have the nine cars that's allowed, I can have two or three more because now I have a free place or a, a cheaper right. place to park them. So, first, I don't think you're solving <coughs> your parking problem by having paid parking. It may be of some assistance. And second, I think you're aspir aspirating the problem by allowing the property owners to get a, a, a cut rate for those parking spaces. I, I, think that that's a, I think that that's going to create a problem. I really do. I mean, I give you an example. If we, if we, if we had it, it just an example, but if someone is, is, wants to bring an extra car now, if they, unless you're going to somehow monitor where they're putting that car for some point of period of time, they're just going to take it out and put it in one of those parking places. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and that's going to be an issue. I think. So that's had this, that's staff's opinion over here um, on, on that. Well, and I'm, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll flip the coin on that, looking at it from the finance side. Okay. Especially, this is, this is beyond the existing parking as it is today. If there were a venture to procure additional parking, to talk about solving parking problems, I'm assuming that those revenues gained on the procurement of the property, we want to finance what that would be, that it's like you're, from a business model, you're cutting your throat if you were to give a preferential treatment to a class of customers from the bank. You know, they just be in dollars and cents. So, my question would be, why undercut your business model on um, any of I, I know that when you work at the restaurant, you get to eat at a lower rate. Like, unless you work at Captain John's down there, you get to pay more. <laughs> but, um, you know, that, that's just my, my two cents for it there on the, the cover, I think. I, I don't know from the finance side, know how to monitor that, but I guess that would be. So if I understand, David, you're saying that um, we shouldn't have reduced rates for residents and stuff, right? Because it presents a problem from your business model, am I well, understanding that? Whatever that is, model yeah. that's just I, you know, a very general I, context now. You know, how about like in the, and I'm going to argue the other side of it now, how about in the commercial district, if Rick wants to drive down to eat at Captain Pete's, and how do you handle the commercial district for those paying customers? Do you do you let Captain Pete? Um, you know, is it a surcharge on his play that you know he he marks your your card or whatever or you know, my frame of reference is um, downtown Wilmington. Yeah, I'm you know, go to in the, the green house, and if you live, you know, <clears> half a mile from 
mile from the waterfront there if you drive down to E. Um, I don't know if they've got their own parking place there at the pilot house, but when I went, I had to park side of the street and put the money in, in the meter. So, you know, it, is that the type of thing we're looking at? I think your point's well taken. I think the parking rate should be the rate and we shouldn't worry about divvying it up. If we do something like seasonal passes, someone may gain a, a, a discount if they buy a seasonal pass. You know, instead of 20 bucks a day, they'll be paying 10. But it seems to me that really complicates things. And when you go back to your loan issue, the bank is going to want to know what your return on investment is. And you would have to make assumptions like, well, it's going to be all residents at the reduced rate, so here's your return versus it's going to be 20 bucks a car regardless of where it came from. Here's your return. So I, um, I think residential discounts is not a way to go, just in my opinion. I think it's more trouble than it's worth. I mean, I wanna, because That's just my opinion. Ultimately, this is going to go out with an RFP, and, and if it comes back, the commissioner is going to have to decide it. Flash this stuff around and make sure that we're, we're you know, eyeballing it from a number of different directions. Well, I'll, I'll put something else out there. Are you talking about if we create a paid parking scenario that the residents, if, if we give them a, something for a reduced rate or, or whatever, um, the parking vendors have actually said, like, the actual owners of the property would get two passes. So if they did drive down or whatever and wanted to park down here for whatever reason during the day that they could, but it would be license plate based. So it wouldn't be available to their renters, to their whatever two cars they would designate, and, and that's it. But what's to say with our current parking situation, if what Tim saying that they're going to use the paid parking. Would they not be using what we have available right now? Are you? I don't know how much of our free parking situation that we have right now that the residents are using. I don't know how you would determine. Right, here's what I'm saying. But they're going to. Here, here's what I'm saying. Whenever you start talking about paid parking, you start educating. The same thing happened with the right of ways. Whenever you start talking about the right of ways, the right of ways used to be clear and people could park in those right away areas. And when we started having the parking committee, we started educating people. And what we did was we educated them to the fact that they could put stuff in their right away that would stop people from parking. So when we start offering discounts for parking lots, where we have 196 parking lots, we just educated every property owner on the beach who has designated parking at their, their house that they now have more available parking at some other place on the beach, which I would assume some of them probably had already thought of, but not a lot of people know that they could do that. They, they, in their mind, just like in my mind, if I'm told that I have six places to park in my rental home or my residential home because of my number of bedrooms, then I will limit the vehicles I have to park there. But when you start giving them the opportunity to use somewhere else, you've now educated them to the fact that they can. So what percentage was doing that already? will increase. That's what I'm saying. We did the same thing with the right of ways, didn't we? Didn't we? we educated people and now you've got stakes up all along the right of ways everywhere. When before you couldn't it, it was a rare thing to find something like that. That's right. They're going up everywhere. But what I'm saying is if 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 there is a season pass offered which in almost all instances where paid parking's been implemented, there is a season pass available. And the owners of those I don't care where they're at. I don't care if they're in Tennessee. If they want to buy a season pass, if that owner wants to buy a season pass for all his kids and, and put their license plates on there, there's nothing to stop them from doing that. But, however, if we have whatever we end up with parking spaces-wise, five or 600 spots, it's still going to be on a first-come, first-served basis. There's no way to guarantee that they're going to have a spot because they got a season pass. And, like, and, and you know what, though? When you, when you kind of discriminate with a season pass, you're not discriminating by right. customer. That's you're right. discriminating by early buy-in. 
That's right. Putting their money up. Season pass. They're out. getting a discount. That's that's Season why that pass. I would have no problem with. That's the only way to do it. Yeah, yeah. Giving discounts yeah. to property owners. At, you know what I mean? But buying a season right. pass. Because people who can't use the season pass aren't going to buy it. They're going to buy it. They're going to do regular. But if you're here, then anyone can buy the season pass. Then it's a little different. But when you start giving discounts just to those property owners, I think that that's going to, going to chew into it. I, but I would I, agree. But I also go back to what you just said. And I intend to start debating vigorously here. It, 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 and go back to what you just said. Everything you just said did not solve our parking problems. The only thing way you're going to solve our parking problem, one, is you've got to figure out a way to clear up these right-of-way areas, and two, or, or accept that they're not usable, and two, get more parking places. Amen. That's the only way you're going to solve parking. Charging for parking <clears throat> places, all you're doing you now is you've got the same amount of value, and you just said it, you've got the same amount of parking places, they're going to fill up just as fast as they did before, and all the areas where we're overrun and where they shouldn't be, they're going to fill up next. And the only thing you're doing is charging for the parking places that will probably fill up first, that fill up every day. Well, let me, let me add on that, I, I, and, I'll, and I'll qualify that by saying by charging for the parking that exists today, it, it doesn't only solve a problem for parking today. What it does is it provides revenue to provide the services for the, for the customers right. that that park, those people parking in there represent. Because those are day trippers, most of them. And that is trash, it's police enforcement. So those are the types of revenues where those are the types of services those revenues would, would be justified on. Otherwise, and, and that's okay if you want to designate as that being your parking problem. But no one has ever said that trash and all these other things are our parking problem. They said we don't have enough parking. Brian's the one that brought up the picture that showed parking all over McCrack and said we need more parking space. All the other committees, they, they recognized, remember, they recognized that people didn't, in one instance, one of the committees, one of their primary things, was to point people in, in, in directions. Both of those other committees recognized that we needed more paid parking. And in case somebody's forgot, this staff has presented to the board numerous plans that show more parking. And, and the town has properties already where parking can, more parking can be put. But I, I, I'm just, I know that by collecting more revenue, we have people pay for the problems that they're creating. Okay, I understand that if that's part of what the committee's talking about. But I was under the impression that we're here because we don't have enough parking. But we feel like we have, don't have enough parking and we need to deal with it. We, I mean, the, the, the whole consensus didn't it start with all these RV parks that were being, and we're worried about all these people that are going to come over here and have nowhere to park. That's that, where it started. Let me ask a question. That, that was mentioned, but I don't think that's the foundation behind it at all. I, it, it seems to me that no matter how many parking spaces you have, it's probably going to fill up. Okay. We also have the emergence of shuttles coming over here. Now, I'm new at this, okay, so I have a little patience. But you have a parking deck. The parking deck gets full and you're done. So, from my simple way of thinking, we have... We want a certain number of parking spaces. I think we're required to have a certain number for FEMA funding. But there, you know, there's a certain amount that we need to figure out we want yes, to have, and that's it. And wait a minute, let me finish, please. Well, let me finish. This is just coming down to what's required and then what we want. But there comes a point where all the parking's full, and you can't park over here, and we have to police it, and we have to sign it not maximize parking throughout Holden Beach, because I know the residents that I've talked to are concerned about the impacts in their neighborhoods and stuff like swordfish and sailfish. Those folks don't want to see 50 cars parked in front of the marsh. But do we have to have them? I don't know. This is, these are opinions I think that need to get worked through. Um, and we need to find out what everybody's looking for. I know 
many people were kind of caught off guard with the results of the, you know, when all the emails came in, they went, what? And I think the town people like me need to avail ourselves of the communication resources the town has better. But what about that? You know, we're going to have 600 parking spaces and that's it. We've got the infrastructure to handle it. We've got the locations. It meets anybody's requirements. And after that, we're going to put signage up, no parking here. And then we'll have to enforce it. Chris, to go ahead, then I want to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, please, uh, you know, fill me in. I was just going way back in the discussion when David mentioned the um, different rate structures for residents or not, and he questioned that. And he mentioned borrowing money for additional property acquisition in the future. I just wanted to make a note that that G word that I usually deal with that sometimes comes up in acquisition, which is grants, that there's a stipulation with at least some of them that the parking, parking has to be equitable. So if you're charging different rates for residents versus not, I'm not sure if you're doing paid parking, if you can claim that it's equitable. Well, and that's what I wanted to speak to. I, you know, residents and property owners alike have parking at their homes. Right. I don't see any advantage. I mean, I've in my professional career, I traveled extensively, and it didn't matter where you went or who lived there. When you went to yep. a restaurant, you paid for parking. That's just right. the way it was. You expected it. Now, the, the vendor or the owner wants to go back and reimburse, add it to his bill, however, that's fine. Number two, really, who, where is the information on how many parking places we must have? Where is that documentation? Do we have a document that says we've got to have X number of parking places on Holden Beach? Is that anywhere? Are you, what are you talking about as far as it being a requirement for what? Parking, free public parking. Is there anything that says we have to have X number of parking places only, on this island? The only document that I'm aware the only requirement for parking that I'm aware of is a requirement for a federal core of engineers project. And I have that reference and can provide it to you. I would love to see days. that. And it pretty much says Beach access is every quarter of a mile of parking within a quarter mile of it. But I can get it to you just to be. Now that, that's what I mean. It's just like you yeah. spoke to. If we add 300 more parking places, then that's going to be 300 more parking places. They're just going to fill up, and then we're going to run into Jeremy's going to run into the same problem. Yeah. People parking where they're not this supposed to be. It's a, it's a minimum number based on distance. Not 300 parking spaces in one location. It's a you've got to have them. So okay. Minimum here, minimum here, minimum here, minimum here. See, so we've now identified a requirement if we're going to go with the the core's engineered what beach is, thing. Wait a minute, though. I, 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 I understand where this dialogue is. I'm trying to get an RFP out for two solicit vendors to come in here and, and provide a solution to the commissioners. Let's, uh, and I don't mean to, to throw a wet blanket on bigger discussion. Now I can provide that information to you. But you just want to be careful we don't go down the squirrel hole here. Okay. So debating the merits of FEMA versus a core project. Well, We're six, getting close to that. Succinctly, I don't think your RFP is ready to go on the street. Well, that's what we're trying to get. Right, so if anyone thinks it is, we can discuss that. But you haven't identified the parking. Yes, we point to the um, um, ordinances and stuff. I haven't seen those. Um, I know that, you know, the public has concerns about where it is. So I just don't think you're ready to put the RFP on the street. For that what reason alone. That, what would you suggest other than the, uh, the, uh, the issues of where parking exists today and how many parking spaces there are? What, what else would you suggest type of information that you can get vendors that are interested in? And, and that, that, that's 
clear up? Because we had that question here offered, and I'll, I'll say it again, it kind of may not have been clear. We know where those parking places are. They're identified by their location and the number that are there. And that's available versus, the, yeah, you don't like we, in the right of We actually provided stuff. it to this committee when it first started. It's, it's on a document. It's in uh, land use too, right? Yeah, well, it's in the Camel land use plan as well, that same document that I'm speaking of. And then there's a map that um, that has maybe has those locations, but we also have an app that sends people. Um, did the app have a map with it, Heather? Yeah. It doesn't have the number. But it does have those locations, and we have the number for each location. That's 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 what I'm saying. In other words, it wouldn't be something that would be hard for us or staff to produce for the RF. So. Right. We know two things: we can charge for parking in the permanent spaces, and we can charge for parking in the right way, at least by one vendor. So those two things are known. So I don't know why you put a, put out an RFP for 180 permanent spots, or you call it off street, or I don't know the designation, but... One is permanent, the other one's available. And then another 200 available, or 220, that would be a total of 400, those are conservative numbers, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to get back a proposal based on those conservative numbers. And obviously if we have more, we can do the math. I think somebody in here can do the math. Right. So that would clear up your RFP. I don't think you have to designate where they're at. You're saying that we want this proposal based on these facts, and it wouldn't matter where the parking lots were at. I want to be clear on my position, because I know everybody may not be clear on my position. There's no way we have enough permanent spots available to park on this island. Land acquisition is going to be a part of it. That takes money. That the residents of this island do not want to pay. I understand that completely. Nobody on this island wants to put in a parking lot for people, for day trippers, or whatever you want to call it. However, I am totally for providing a reasonable amount of parking for those people. It's it, there's no way it's not going to be on a first-come, first-served basis. And I think you can't discriminate. 50, how many permits a year? 60 houses going up a year. So you're losing 300 feet a year. And I promise you, whether I'm here or not to see the end of right-of-way parking, it's going to end itself for the most part. Properties that people have been parking on, Avenue A is gone. There used to be 100 cars there. McCray Street. If Dunescape decides to do something, that's going to be gone. On the ocean side of McCray Street, houses are going up. It's, it's, it's been taken, Block Q, right over here beside the bridge, where people park their boats and trailers illegally every time they put in because the wildlife only has 10 spots or 12 spots, whatever it is. That's being allowed, and it, we could stop it any minute. Jeremy could shut it down tomorrow. That's unfortunate because people need a place put their boats in and out. Whether the wildlife didn't provide it, but maybe we can do something. Maybe not. But if we acquire that property, buy it, then and put in parking there, then we would not only generate some revenue, those people would have an opportunity to park their boats and trailers, maybe 10 of them or 12, whatever we could do to work those in and provide some services. Now we gotta have bathrooms. And they bring trash, and everybody dumps it out, and we pick it up day in and day out, and we can't keep up with it because we don't have the staff to do it. We don't have the trucks to accommodate it. We don't have the places to take it, and we've got just a couple bathrooms. We've got Porta John sitting everywhere. It's a problem. It's a growing problem. People are not going to stop coming. If they're coming on shuttles or whatever, buses, I don't care how they're going to get here. They're going to get here. And... It, and, if, and so we, we would be the ones that say, okay, we got all these people coming over here and we don't want to make any money off of them. We're still going to have to provide the services. If they come on a bus, they still got to use a bathroom. If they come on a bus, they're still going to throw trash away on the cans on the beach. If they come on a the bus, they're still going to do the, 
whatever they do that, that makes everybody angry all the time. We've got a chance to get ahead of this, and we're not going to get ahead of it on the taxpayer's dime on this island. We're going to have to charge. It's going on in every community up and down the coast. I know very few that you can go to anymore and you do not have to pay. So that's my position. This is a committee of people that we're trying to resolve what I think is a problem. If we want to leave it alone, you educate the people on how to put up posts and ropes. I would advise everybody that doesn't want parking in front of their properties to put up posts and ropes. Are posts and ropes in the right of way okay? Yes. It's I didn't a, know it's an ordinance. It's They're perfectly okay. okay. Is that what we want to see on the island? Absolutely not. It's coming down the, the pipe to change that ordinance back to before it was allowed because it's, and that's unfortunate because I see people that have nice yards and stuff and want to keep it up. I get it. You don't want cars parking there. You, you just simply create an ordinance eliminating right-of-way parking, and that's your ordinance. And you don't put up posts and ropes. You don't have to. But you've got to have an option of where to go. The pier's being sold. The, there's countless properties where people park that may not be available a year from now. So if you, if you have four or 500 available, Mike Sullivan, I think, stated that we had like 700 if you have, I don't care what we have, it's not going to be that number next year. And the year after that, it's not going to be that number. And so on and so forth until it's pretty much been eliminated. So they're, they're coming. People are going to come to this beach to enjoy this beach, and I encourage that. I want people. I, I do. It, it, it'd be unfortunate where anybody couldn't come and enjoy Holden Beach. I don't care where they're from or who they are. So we... We have to do something. We absolutely have to do something. The only way to make paid parking viable is to buy property. It's, it's the only way it's going to work. I understand that. So I want everybody to know that that's my position. And to buy property, that takes money. And to get that money, we have to charge. It's, it's just inevitable. And then we will have a finite, we will have a finite number of parking spaces in the end. And when it's full, then Jeremy can handle it. From there, and people don't have to worry about people parking in their grass anymore. Hopefully, I think this is where uh, I'm in general agreement with you. We have to determine what finite is, not in, you know every parking space we can possibly come up with. In, in my opinion, there's some reasonable number. What ties into that is David's requirements that come from the core. So much so far, I mean, because you may have to in order to meet the course requirement, develop some parking um, uh, in areas in right of way in order to meet it. Like up where, you know, Harbor Acres is, I'm not sure where you could put in a lot, so to speak. It might have to be right of way. But I think what has to be determined is what that reasonable amount of parking is. Well, from what I've heard from the core, and I, I think I've got it crystal kind of clear, Correct me if I'm wrong, Dave. You have to have parking. Not only do you have to have parking, you have to have parking down the beach. And you have to have accesses down the beach. It can't all be in one spot. So we got a lot of pushback for town-owned properties down in the 800 block or wherever. And we may actually, it, it just may actually have to be put there in order for us to meet the requirements that's of the core to do the beach renourishment. So if everybody gets up in arms about it, there's really nothing we can do. I understand nobody wants to see a parking lot. I get it. but well, it, it th This is one of the reasons I'm here. A lot of the residents are clueless on a lot of this work that's been done, a lot of what the requirements are. They have no clue what the core is proposing to do for us and what it can mean for us in the future. That's kind of what we need to somehow, I can carry some of that back, but if I've got core requirements, I can say this is what they want, and in layman's terms, if I can say that's going to cut our beach renourishment bill in half by 50% in a storm, and we'll get periodic beach renourishments courtesy of the government, if I recall, that's what Bob said. 
Whatever that benefit is, we've decided that that's a thing and people need to understand, okay, so you might have to, we might have to put 10 parking spaces over here on sailfish and swordfish so that we get that benefit. And then people go, now I understand. But that's going to be a product of a study that's turned, that comes to an end three years from now. That, that, that core beach will be defined in terms of cost-benefit analysis, recreation, strong damage protection, height of the dune, all that kind of stuff to include what the requirements will be for public access. So we ain't going to have that answer for this purpose. I thought you said that we had... No, I said the Corps' general requirements okay. are this far for this, you know, between access is on a federal beach, but we don't know where that federal beach is going to be defined in terms of cost-benefit analysis as the best fit for whole beach. Yeah. We don't, we, we are automatically, there's been a, an erroneous assumption, it may be exactly correct, our engineers are really good, that the course beach overlays precisely the central reach project. I don't know that, but we are oh, going to have you. to have this coastal stone damage report done in order to define the length and location of the best berm out there on the front. That so, is going to drive where the locations have to be. I got if you. any new ones actually have to be done. So what you're telling me, David, if I understand... We don't have that answer. But I was under the I was under the assumption that the Corps was going to do the entire beach, and you're telling me a, a best economically I got viable you. project. It will include inlet to inlet, but it may not be. It may not. It may only be three miles in the middle of the beach. I got you, and that's where the parking requirement is. That's where the okay. parking requirement will be. Now, what we're looking at is something different, although, you know, the three miles in the middle of the beach is, I, I, it, uh, I mean, we, we're talking about the east end, we're talking about the thousand block, we're talking about the whole beach for parking. Okay, okay. The, the parking requirements for outside agencies like CAMA, the core and all this, we, we, we got a good opportunity to do a lot of deep diving on some of that stuff in those committees. And uh, it was hard for me and Ronnie to kind of express this, and I, I'll try to express this because I, I, I fear that this is where it all gets, and it goes exactly what David's saying, but I fear that people don't understand this exactly the way they should, and I'm not Amen. sure I do either <laughs> when it comes to those requirements for parking. I fear that this is what it is. There is... In order to have those projects done, whether it's CAMA, whether it's it's the federal, whether it's FEMA or any of that, there's an there's an expectation of reasonable access for the public to be able to get to the beach, and that's just not people who live here. But people right, right agree. Right. Now, for that reasonable access, I, I fear, is then interpreted at all these agencies' locations by policy, which means that. Their job is to make sure there's reasonable access. They have an internal policy. That internal policy probably has something along the lines of some. It could be anything that generates what they feel is reasonable access. So what we have is the core that says you have to have this, you know, in so many places, but doesn't have any kind of definitive thing because they have a policy. And that policy could change with the with the person who's in charge of the core next week. And the same thing with the director of CAMA, that whatever that policy that's driving what reasonable access is could change. So usually what happens when you get a grant, you send the grant up, they'll ask you if you've got any parking places, you tell them you do, they'll look at it and say, yes, it's reasonable. And they send it back and say, it's okay. Same thing I imagine happens with the core. I know the same thing, except those things aren't acceptable to family. And whatever reasonable access is, is then defined by only by challenge. That be all I'm saying. So I think that our, and the same thing happened because it came up a lot, and we never could define anything other than just what David says and what I'm telling you now. 
as being a number. No number that we could ever find was defended per project. Does that help everybody? So basically the way per project, you tell them what you got and they just give you a thumbs up. Thumbs they, they determine whether or not they consider that to be reasonable access. Apparently they have some sort of a policy now that says you've got to have so many accesses ever so far along and they've probably got a reasonable number and it could be any kind of policy. It could be that if you've got a permanent population of 500 and the availability of 16,000, you've got to have 100 parking places. That might be a policy because somewhere some attorney or somebody told them that's reasonable access. It happens a lot in, in government that that's the way the function is carried out. I agree with you because I've worked in it. Yeah, so you know what I'm saying. Yeah, so uh, that'll get done in the conference room up in Wilmington. That's right, right. So you won't never have a permanent based off of the changes yeah. in staff and everything like that. So. Well, I mean, I, I got uh, the, the two answers that I needed as far as the, the charging thing. Uh, I, I think that, you know, overall what we want to solicit for is a turnkey operation. Parking is going to be handled by a firm that is in charge of enforcement, in charge for all we got to do is sit back and collect the checks is in general what we're doing. One of the things that wasn't clear to me when that guy came in and did his thing was if they are if they need office space. That, that wasn't clear to me. I'm I'm and I only point out that I saw it in here. Um, I'm assuming that everything is virtual and they're working out of their video control. And it's a back shop. It's a back shop function. Um, but other, other than that, you know, after, after looking through here, um, the rest of it seems pretty straightforward. But I, I, I think the uh, ability to, uh, to send them to those locations like Matt that we have and the Lainey's plan numbers, um, um, I, I think that there can be enough that could be enough information that folks are really interested. They would do, they would do a deep dive and look into it uh, to see what it is. I would suggest there's, in going through here, there are some vague things. I cited a few of them, but when we say these people will be trained in accordance with industry standards, we don't say what the standard is or um, when we talk about the town you know the contractor shall provide financial and technical reports as required by the town I think we need to take some time and go we want this and this monthly or weekly so they have something more concrete to work with a lot of times when you do things like that contractors will assume they're going to want these reports once a week when we really want need them once a month. So I think some of that kind of language needs to be tightened up or eliminated. There was a, I saw a fair amount of that stuff in here. And again, the other thing I saw missing was um, when they come in with this proposal and it would be good if they could give us an estimate, not a guarantee, on what type of revenue the town would see. And the reason I mentioned that, if we were only going to make 5000 bucks, is it even worth messing with? If it's going to be a million bucks, then it could very well be worth messing with. So, um, I, and David, I don't know if you can ask that legally or not, but I think that should be included in there as well. Would well, we... They, they talk about they have to submit their budget. Does that address my concern? It would for me. Okay. As, as long as you know what you're going to get out of it, <laughs> that's that's what I would want to know. We're going to make X amount. Because some of this stuff, when I read all the data security and all the other stuff, you know, it all adds into money. Um, there's a lot of stuff about security. I guess we have to have it if people are paying with credit cards and stuff like that. Um, that gets into just contractual requirements that I just don't have much depth in, fortunately. Can you get something by Tuesday, a draft? No. So, we are going to, we're admitting 
the town property owners receiving a free pass. We're admitting that. And then there's that part about the office hours. I don't remember him saying anything about being in the office. I, I never did either. Yeah, I, I, I didn't remember. But anyway, they, there's that. I, you you got to remember that this was put out prior and then solicitations came into them. And they might not have needed, you know, that type of thing, especially, you know, COVID accelerated a lot of virtuality yeah. um, in, in terms of that. So, um. And then I had, there, there was a section in there about the police where it's talking about, um, I, I was reading it, 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 it was talking about their what they were required to do and provide, and then there was a part in there, there was a part in there where it talked about the police, and I wasn't real clear, clear, yeah, it's on, it's on that page where general parking services required. What there, page is that, Tim? It's, it's up in the right it's corner. It's down there in, uh, it's like, it doesn't have a page number. Upper right corner? Yeah, it's page but um, yeah, it's down there in the middle of the page around H. I read that two or three times, and I, I'm not sure it says respond, respond to a request from the town to suspend or emphasize enforcement along certain roads or in certain areas. The town also reserves the right to temporarily suspend enforcement along any street or in any zone according to the needs of the town. And this is the town will make every effort to provide the management firm adequate notice concerning the location and duration of any such suspension or higher level of enforcement. And I'm just wondering what that means. Yeah, I'm not afraid of that. Yeah, I, 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 I'm tell you, I, I, that, that's right there when you give them free pass. Yeah, well, that, that yeah. part, you got paid for it. Uh, that, that's why I tell Jeremy, winking to Jeremy and say, hey man, let him let him yeah, I don't know what it is just hearing you go through it and reading it. I'm, I'm guessing it's because there's stuff in there about festivals and concerts. So it may be something where you say, hey, I don't want enforcement during concert hours in this location. You know, I, I don't know if that's what they mean by that. So it would have certain location and duration, but that's, that's kind of what I interpret it as. Also there, you could define we have two festivals and 16 concerts. Saying. I, I would feel so, more comfortable if that was a definitive right, right. thing you can turn it off and on because being doing what we do over here, optional enforcement and not enforcement becomes an issue. You did it for them, you won't do it for us. Right. It looks like you can do it when you want to, you know what I mean, that kind of thing. So I think that needs to be a little bit more depending on what we're it could even be a situation. It doesn't have to be a it could be situational you could say town special events or something of that nature, but not just we can turn it off and we can turn it on. That's the only thing I didn't know what that means. Yeah. I think the first part of it might mean like we really have trouble in this parking lot down here. I mean mm -hmm. keep an eye on it. But the second yeah, I, part I don't, I don't have a problem with that. It's that last part. Yeah, the that second part, part I don't know. Um one one thing I'd like to be said, and I'm going to put it on Jeremy, and I'm sorry. Um, I was here Memorial Day weekend all weekend, riding around, looking, and observing a lot of stuff. If there weren't over 100 cars parked illegally that could have been ticketed so if we chose to do that, I just, I want to make sure I'm not, the, the site corners at the boat ramp, especially around Block Q, people just park wherever. You, you know camera, AEC things should not be parked in. People blocking driveways, people parking in people's houses that I know, because I live here, they weren't there, you know, and they're Cars overflowing from rental houses into the street on Ocean Boulevard, everywhere, not just one, everywhere. 
We could have towed or ticketed cars all day. I understand that we don't. We, we do, and a lot did. I don't know how many I can get that number. I know. I, it doesn't. I, it, it, a lot go by the wayside, but it that problem is going to – has been an issue, and I just I, – I want to confirm and get it out there that this is this is really a problem. And I don't want people to think that it's that it's not a problem. And I don't want people to think that we're sitting in here for no reason at all. So I don't know how to get it out there that, that it's just something that has to be resolved. It can't be kicked down the road by another parking committee. It it doesn't make any sense. It we have to put a plan together. If we end up with 300 legitimate spots or whatever it is, then that that's what we have. And then the enforcement has to kick in. Like you can't park here and then you have to come by show and the county has to do something or, or whatever the next solution is because we only have so much. But uh, I just want you to, to speak about, like reiterate what your opinion is if we have a problem here or not as far as people parking illegally on the aisle. We have, to me, we have a small issue. I didn't see hundreds and I was over here this weekend. Um, and I do know our officers are ticketing every day for the ones that we do run across. Um, we do have some issues with it, but I don't, I don't think it's as big a problem as what it's portrayed to be. That's just my opinion. Um, I'm not saying it's not an issue at all, at all because it is, but I don't think it's the issue that it's portrayed to be. I think the biggest one that I saw outside of the boat ramp, right. because they don't have any <coughs> provided parking for their clientele over there, um, is Ocean Boulevard. The property lines are not at the edge of the road. They're into the, their driveways are not at the edge of the road, and there were hundreds. There were they car after car after car backed up all the way to the edge of the pavement. So. The last two cars in every driveway of the houses that did that are parking in right. the right-of-way of Ocean Boulevard. That problem is going to get compounded because you're going to jam two bike lanes the next time when, when this street's paved out there. So that's going to, whether people realize it or not, going to shorten somebody's driveway up a pretty good bit. So the two cars that were at the edge of the pavement this past Memorial Day, when the bike lanes were put in, those two wouldn't have been there. They couldn't have. It would be impossible because the bicycles were going to run into the side of them. And I guess I'm I'm trying to inform residents and people that it it's it's going to get worse and it's going to get worse fast. And Tim, you know. The inspection department, they can come down here and say, okay, how many houses were built this year? Well, you can base your average lot at 50 feet, and you can do, well, 60 houses were built outside of them being on Ocean Boulevard. I mean, any side street, Brunswick Avenue, wherever, I mean, the 50 foot goes away. So um, you really don't lose it on Ocean Boulevard because we don't allow it to start with. But I'm just saying every, every house that goes up, Every time a piece of property like the pier or the block or Avenue A or the pavilions, every, every time something goes up for sale that the community has been parking over years and years and years and years, if they build more condos over here at Bridgewater, if they, if they build on Block Q, everybody's going to say, hey, guys, why didn't y'all do something? And I don't want to be a part of that. And if I am a part of that, then it's not going to be at my discretion it's gonna, they're going to understand they have to replay all these tapes back that I gave it a shot. I gave it a shot to provide a, a little bit. I'm not talking about creating thousands of parking spaces. I'm just trying to cement down a reasonable amount. And I'm going to use the same word Tim used. And I'm going to use the same word the Corps uses or whoever looks at grants or whatever. I'm just trying to provide a reasonable amount. There's nothing we can do outside of that we can't make this island anything more exclusive. than it is yeah it's not exclusive no so we can't make it a parking lot I'm not trying to make it a parking lot i'm trying to people have taken for granted all these years that there's going to be 
70 places to park at the pier. And they can go use the pier. Gil Bass has been so gracious all these years to get to the beach there and all that stuff and use that access. And anybody can drive down the street and see seven Remax signs in front of it. I mean, for people not to think that it's it's going to go away, it it's it, it when it's yeah that's right that's right Rick when it's gone it's gone. There's nothing that Brian can do about it or Tim Evans can do about it or Dave Hewitt can do about it. It, we have to somehow, I mean, if the residents absolutely don't want parking, I represent the residents, and then we won't have any parking. But that that will in, include a limited amount for them as well. So I, I, I don't know. I just think a reasonable amount is, in, I've just, I've got it in my head. It's around four or 500 spots. That's kind of what we got now. If we eliminate the right-of-way parking, and put them in permanent lots. And in those permanent lots, if we charge for that, then we will have the funds that we don't have to increase taxes or, or put any more burden on people to take care of trash, bathrooms, sewer, um, all those facilities that people need when they do come over here. Because to, to think that they're not going to get here somehow, somebody will run a, a ferry or something. Yeah. I mean, they're coming. And, and we have to figure out how to pay for that and not the, the mountains of trash on the beach blowing around Sunday, Memorial Day, where you, you need dump trucks out there, not pickup trucks. I mean, it's, they're bringing coolers of beer, coolers of drinks. The, the the five dollar beach chair that they bought is left out there stacked up. The umbrellas are broken, turned upside down, blowing it. It it's it's bad it's really bad. I'm not there's a trash can there which makes people comfortable with trying to throw something away. I get it and I appreciate them at least getting it to the trash can, but you got a little can there and you need a dumpster. So that's all I'm saying. That it's not just a place to put a car. It's a some way to accommodate the people that are going to come whether you have a parking space for them or not. They're going to come. And, and I agree with Brian 100% on that perspective of it. Uh, we do have the beach accesses now. Those beach accesses do have, you can have a can at the end, like he says. But to really make it work, which I talked to Christy when we were talking on the, the PNR forum, forum we had a, a month or so ago, there needs to be at those accesses, there needs to be some type of restroom, uh, whether it be a portalette or a, a, a structure, portalette would probably be the easiest, and we need a, 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 a staging area. I, I was really tickled to death to see the yellow trolley bus come over the bridge, which will reduce the number of cars, it won't reduce the number of people and trash and stuff that's coming, but it will reduce the number of cars, but we need to designate areas for them to stop where they can stop, and you know, they, I think they came to the city and asked maybe for what to do, but we need to say, well, if you're going to stop at this one, you need to stop here, 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 and here. Instead of throwing all the people at one place, spread them out at the beach, but they have to be, I mean, just, that's what Brian would need to, to do. We're going to have to acquire some property, period. Either that or five years from now, when I'm not a commissioner, I'll be sitting over here grumbling, but we should have done it when we had the chance. So we're going we're gonna to work on that problem with some more on the commissioner side. But we, we need to upgrade our accesses to a point where we can handle the trash. And the, the people at the beach, they, like all people, got to go to the restroom. So, you know, you find them under people's houses and all kinds of places, which is not easy okay. for you to enforce. Yeah. And it's just ridiculous for the property owners to have to put up with it. Now, those on the, the, the each end of the beach, they're in the exclusive properties, don't have those concerns. But, you know, the, the middle of the island does. So that's, uh, like Brian says, we're going to have to do something. But there's, you know, we, there's got to be a, we're going to have to set forth some guidelines for this is, if, if we want to have this, this much parking. And in the places where we need it, I include names under the block, Brian, which, you know, I'm not real happy about it. But, you know, there's got to be within a quarter of a mile of the access point. You don't want to put it a half a mile up because you know good well, I'm human nature. I can get a walk a half a mile to the accident. I'm going to first sand dune I see, I'm over it. So, you know, it's uh, it's one of those things we need to make it within reason. We need to make it enforceable. 
and we need to make it uh, adequate for the people and, and have some type of facilities because, you know, like even coming over, I, you know, I've seen people change their bathing suits in the beer parking lot. Me too. I mean, you just said they just do it. So we need some kind of, we need some something in place to take care of the growing number of people that are being here. Because so it's not going to get any less. You got enough to do your own administrative code just uh, so everybody will know we're talking this thing up, but um, it's been made perfectly clear to me that the commissioners and this uh, this RFP reflects that that the, it's the board of commissioners is going to make the decision on this unless they send it back to this committee to vet. I do not see that happening <coughs> like as far as. You know, once the solicitations come in, um, that this will be on the commissioners. And they're going to retain, if it was a subject to be determined on it, but I am assuming they will retain sole discretion on modifying the terms of negotiation. No one's going to have that contract. So, you know, this is to, this is to kind of chum up interest, get sharp swirling in the water, and, and get get some uh, get some leads and get those fish in front of the commissioner so they can uh, potentially develop a, a contract. So you know that's from my side on the administration. You know, we can type some of this stuff up and go ahead and get it out there. Give a couple of weeks um, to get out. We've got some leads on a, a wide uh, uh, population to send it to directly. Um, but I, I got what I. So this is more like a request for interest. It's not to, it's this is the contract. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. It's okay. not a contract. Right. Yeah. But it right. would be the basis of a contract. That's I understand point. that. Yeah. I understand we that. We it up when we get to that point. And some of that is, is going to be part of the dialogue of, you know, between the board and uh, the presentations. I'm assuming there will be presentations that it's not. I got paid you. parking at Holton Beach, just like the podcast, is going to be transformation. And that is going to be worthy of merit discussion. And, and those things will benefit uh, the arrangement between a potential vendor and a community. But I got it. Well, I think that And we nail down the part about the uh, the, the free passes for the for the property owners or homeowners would just because they want to buy a permit and buy a permit. I, right. I Same price as anyone else in the country. I could ask by that already. Good. If anybody else has anything of it's pet. I I the only thing I would like to ask specifically is on the parking enforcement hours. I recall when he spoke, when the provider spoke to us, he did say that in more cases than not, they did decide to go more of a 9 to 5. And the reason they cut it off at 5 in particular was for concerts and dinners and things. So I'm just asking, do you want to leave it 8 to 6 because this is just an RFP? Or do you want to consider what is more of a norm that doesn't interfere as much with dinner time and concerts. I, 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 that's my only... I, I think 9 to 5 would be acceptable. I would, you know, that brings up a question if you get there at 8, I guess you have to, and you're going to stay all day. At 9 o'clock you better call in and you better and start paying, them. right, okay. Now, I don't have a problem with that. So without anything else, I mean, that's what we came here to do is to put that. One other thing. Does this committee have, like, a set of objectives, what we're trying to accomplish? I've, I've actually got a, co a copy of that. I okay. Like yeah, because, and do we keep, like, you got your heart. minutes. Okay, and I must admit I haven't availed myself of previous minutes. I just, you know, like the RFP showed up in the email, and I think it, and maybe everybody but me knows it, um, you know, we all should get a look at it and provide you comments by some day, some point. And 
I personally believe you make a comment, you don't say this sucks, you try to offer a resolution to your comment as well if you can. Um, but if we got that kind of stuff, like I'd like to see the objectives and if we keep an action item list or something so we know we've got to get it done by the next meeting or to support David or the commissioners, that would be good. Yeah, we uh, actually retired a couple months when we got the pushback Garage. when the <laughs> misunderstanding from the uh, all the email blasts that, that we were trying to create more free parking when that actually wasn't we we just did, we weren't detailed enough, so I think going forward we're, we're really going to have to be clear on what we're trying to do. So maybe I got this for you right here. those objectives that we had may need to be scrubbed a little bit. So don't take them as, yeah, right. Well, as I know you, it gives don't. a general guide to where we're going. Um, one thing I know probably everybody. Um, you know, I, I resemble this remark. A lot of people don't avail themselves of all the communications that are out there. They don't go looking for it. And I think that's one of the problems. They weren't aware that, I'm, I'll speak for myself, I didn't know we had a parking committee really going on. Woody Tyner lived across the street from me. But I didn't go look and see what the town's doing and stuff. So, um, and I don't know how to fix that problem. I was, you know, the town's got just about everything under the sun out there available if you go looking for it. So if there's a way to encourage the residents to get up and go look before we start reacting to all this, that would be a good thing. Or try to keep up and help you guys, help us through these things. That would be good. How can we do that other than basically pleading with them every board meeting <laughs> and to get on the website and to please send us their input there was i I'll, get I'll, a i mean i don't know any other way to do it unless there was only one door thing i thought door. of and this may be stupid but my church has an automatic phone call system where they send out messages if you could say hey there's going to be a parking committee meeting and there's a you know you ought to go look at what we're doing go to the website and everyone gets that automatic call maybe they'll get off their butt and do it. But I, I'll say, I'll get a Holden Beach newsletter and I'll look at it and up the top it may say something about tie-dye stuff and I go, yeah, whatever. And I don't read the, that there's going to be a budget hearing meeting tonight. So uh, I'm the problem. I'm the creator of that problem. I just, uh, I'm trying to pay more attention. But again, a lot of people I talk to about the parking and stuff, they're like, what? And I, I just don't know how to get them to engage. So do I just... Something. Do something. <laughs> if they like it, you're not going to hear anything about it. If they don't, they're going to see. I mean, I know this is going to be emails. It's, 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 it's got minutes in it. Thank you. I, I just, you know, it's it's the residents and property owners' fault for not keeping up. You guys are working for us, and you know we need to let you know what we think, what we don't think, and so you don't get all this backlash when you try to pull the trigger on something. And that's all I'm going to say. Well, we need, I, I think as far as the community is concerned, and we all hear what we're doing with the town, you're going to get pushback. Sure. And when you really do do something, there are other stakeholders involved other than the town. And they are true stakeholders. And they're on the other side of that bridge. And they are, they are stakeholders. I think they just walk on them. But that is a public beach. Exactly. And uh, that's why the core has the language they do and those yep. policies are in place. So when you think about feedback and that kind of thing, the informational, you got to remember. I can tell you that in the past, other beaches and other places, their real pushback came from people who did not live inside. Because they're going to push back in a different direction. So that's why you need to We'll do the best we can to keep everybody informed. That's why, you know, creating a, we have a reasonable amount of parking spaces right now, don't get me wrong. I feel like we do. If we continue to use the right of way as it exists and the permanent spots that we do have, we have ample parking right now. I agree with everybody on that. The, what I'm trying to get ahead of is the loss of the available parking. And that's going to affect not only the residents of the island, but the same stakeholders that you just talked about. And 
the the reasonable word I'll keep using it there somebody's going to put a number on that one day and if we either going to have it or we don't and I don't know what it's going to be it might be 100 and if it's 500 we could be in trouble so we're just trying to get a jump on it I will say this um I get emails a, a lot so and I try to respond to the bulk of them unless they're overwhelmingly too many um there's empty chairs in every every meeting well the the last one that we did have and i know people might not have been aware we do have limited seating in here but there was only a few people that showed up there was room for more um we're trying to get the audio stuff you know we're tossing it around trying to get the communications whether you're here or not, to be available to everyone. Uh, Heather does a great job putting it on the website. Yep. All the information's right there. I, I just don't know what else we can do other than, I, if you put it in the paper, not everybody's gonna read the paper. Yeah. I just, I don't know what else we can do to keep the community informed, but to encourage, you know, we have some smart people here, some really smart people on the island. And somebody can, you know, somebody may turn the light bulb on, and it, that would just be the answer. And it could be right in front of all of our faces, and it, you never know where it's going to come from. So that's why I encourage everybody. I know, you know, nobody wants a parking lot beside their house. I, I get it. But you, you, somebody's going to get one beside their house. It, 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 there's nothing you can do about it. And somebody already has one beside their house. So if, if it's a requirement going forward for beach nourishment or if we need the funds actually need the funds to keep from raising taxes to cover you know it's a huge expense huge expense or if we need more officers to take care to of to take care of the trash and the facilities for the for the day trippers and the and the majority the people across the bridge and here we need the money right there there's no other place to get the money to, to do that type of thing there, there's no I, that I know of if there was I think somebody would have already figured it out other than to raise taxes and that's the last thing that I'm going to bring up in that chair up there so I, I'm i looking at, every, at some other alternative to try to it's not to create parking spaces you know so we'll have a, a thousand it, it's to maximize what we do have at our disposal disposal and acquire something that may make sense to help out and then that's going to be it but with that money and those funds we won't have to burden the people the taxpayers that live here anymore for trying to deal with it when they're coming on buses or, or boats or whatever we will we should could have the funds if we get ahead of it to take care of that and that's that's really all I'm saying. And I it's just it's not just my opinion, it's a lot of people's opinion, but um there's gonna be people against me, I realize that. I probably have to wear a helmet either way. <laughs> but I'm willing to do it. I mean sometimes you gotta make tough decisions. I do it every day. That's what I do for a living. So I it's just my position. And I you know, I we got a long way to go on this thing. If we try to roll it out next year, you know, we can't wait till, we can't kick it down till December and then expect to pull it off because it's not going to happen. We need to jump on it right now. And we don't have time to, let's get the RFP out, see what we get back, send it to the board. That's my suggestion. And let the board decide what to do with it from there. And that's where I stand. And, um, Unless anybody else has any anything to say, we can get out of here. Um, That's the direction we need to go, I believe. But again, as far as communication is concerned, uh, I found, in my opinion, on the Property Owners Association, the most effective means of communication was a letter in the mail. And everybody shook their head, oh, no, that costs so much money, we can do it much easier over the, the internet and stuff like that. So we moved our membership from 400 to 1100 by simply sending a letter. 
So communication to the residents uh, is, if you want to get everybody on the same page, then that's, that would be my suggestion. It costs money, but it, it, it is, and always will be, the most effective way to get information to residents. Everybody needs money. Well, when it's from Holden Beach, they do. I mean, you know. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I've seen it happen myself. Let, let me wet blanket you there. <laughs> there you go. We're not going to send out a letter on every issue that might be. Oh, no, right. no, I if, understand if that. The commissioners want to pick an issue that they want to directly communicate. That's an easy thing. We're, we're you know, oh, every agenda that comes out has got 37 things that are important on them. We got one for fifty million dollars on the fifteenth of June again. It's just one of other things that are on there. So uh, we're not going to solve individuals' lack of interest and authority. Authority, but it's a lofty goal. Again, I'm sorry for being a wet blanket. We, I would, we, we're just trying to get an RFP out of that. Really. I understand that. I'm trying to do. I hear you. The world's I hear you, but I I think <laughs> everyone would agree that some issues are a burr under everybody's saddle, like the whole parking thing, parking in my neighborhood. If you're out fixing the beach for $50 million, we're like, good, go fix the beach. I'm not trying you to. Know what you I know. Like that, like that, that kind of <laughs> yeah, I bet you would. It comes to my idea. There you go. So well, I think uh, do we need to make a motion to uh, send this RFP to the, the commissioners for a vote? Now, I'm gonna send it out to have responses to come in and get the responses in front of the commissioner. If we send it to the commission, just gonna take two more words. So you're just gonna tighten it up based on I'm discussions today and fly it out. This an administrative document. Discretion, get it out on the street. Those solicitations come in. It goes before the commissioner for their consideration on what they want to do. Motion to, to do just that. Okay. Second. Get started. Can't get finished. Get started. Sure. Seems like we have a. Nothing else. I'll make a motion we get out of here. Second. 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 